Members, we are going to move back in the file to file item 156. That's AB 853. The clerk will read. Assembly Bill 853 by Assemblymember Roger Hernandez, an act relating to energy. Mr. Hernandez, you may open. Mr. Speaker and members, AB 853 prohibits a regulatory utility from outsourcing work associated with nuclear, electrical, and gas infrastructure unless it first obtains the approval of the Public Utilities Commission. Recently, this issue has come to a head with the announcement by Southern California Edison that it was laying off nearly 400 IT workers with another, another 100 leaving voluntarily and outsourcing the work to two foreign countries, companies. To add insult to injury, there have been allegations that the H-1B visa program has been used to bring workers in to replace current workers. This bill takes an important but balanced approach. It does not ban such outsourcing outright, but where regulatory, regulatory or regulatory I'm sorry, regulated utility wants to outsource such work, I think it is reasonable to make them go before the PUC and demonstrate that the work can be done safely and securely. I ask for your I vote on this matter. Mr. Rendon, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We live in a very dangerous world in, we, in which we are constantly on, on alert and at risk from uh, terrorist attacks. This is the new reality of the world we live in. Consequently, investor-owned utilities that are granted the exclusive license to operate these uh, facilities by the state of California must not, be must not be allowed to offshore critical jobs that might jeopardize the safety, security, or reliability of sensi sensitive pieces of infrastructure. Decisions to outsource hundreds and perhaps thousands of jobs should, be buried, should not be buried in multi-billion dollar general rate case applications. AB 853 does not ban using ratepayer monies to outsource jobs. It merely requires that prior to outsourcing jobs, a utility must make a filing to the CPUC and demonstrate that the outsourcing will not jeopardize the safety, security, or reliability of our electric, natural gas, or nuclear infrastructure. This is a common sense act to protect the well-being of all Californians, and I urge an I vote. Mr. Alejo, you are recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. I also stand in support of AB 853, because we have come to a time and place in the state where, when we need to preserve our skilled labor jobs. We must do all we can to make sure California jobs remain California jobs. This is not a loss, a loss of jobs through attrition or through technology advancement. This is about directly shipping good jobs overseas. So I ask every member on this floor that if you support American jobs, you'll support AB 853. Ms. Brown, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong support of AB 853. We need to create an environment that encourages companies to invest in our local workforce. Unfortunately, the current H-1B program is being abused in giving perverse incentives to outsource jobs that, our Americans, are, that Americans are qualified to do. I would like to thank the author for bringing the bill forward, and I strongly encourage an I vote. Mr. Gatto, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the whole purpose behind the H-1B visa program was to import workers only when an American worker could not do the job. When a company abuses that, when that type of thing happens, it's a serious blow to our workforce. This is a very, very important bill. I commend the author for bringing it, and I ask for I vote. Ms. Gonzalez, you're recognized. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> on March 17th, the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing into the outsourcing of American utility jobs. The committee heard from Dr. Ronel Hira, a professor at Howard University, who recounted the experiences of several workers at an investor-owned utility who were told their IT work would be outsourced and that the company wanted them to train the guest worker replacements. If the employees said no, they would be terminated with cause, lose their severance package, and lose eligib eligibility for unemployment in insurance. They were forced to train their foreign replacements. Members, these California-based workers deserve better than this, and it's far too often that these kind of things are happening. This is called knowledge transfer, and it should stop. Let's stand up for our own good utility jobs here in California and pass AB 853. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Mr. Eduardo Garcia, you are recognized. Mr. Speaker and members, very briefly, I'd like to rise and support of AB 853 as the chairman of the Jobs Committee. I think it's important that we 
continuously are looking for public policy that's going to assist in the retainment of California jobs and not the exporting of jobs. So thank you very much. So you know additional debate on this item. With that, the clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. 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 Clerk will close the roll. Tally the vote. Ayes 42. Noes 19. Measure passes. Members, I'm going to move back in the file to file item 144. That's AB 374. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 374 by Assemblymember Nazarian, an act relating to health care coverage. Mr. Nazarian, you may open. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. More than 16 million Californians with chronic conditions are greatly impacted by health plans and insurers' reliance on step therapy protocols, which force patients to fail first on several alternative medications before they are permitted to obtain the medication deemed appropriate. Plans may require a patient to try up to five different medications before receiving access to the medication prescribed. Also, the duration of each step is up to the health plan and has been known to last up to 90 days. AB 374 simply allows a prescribing physician based on his, her professional judgment to request a step therapy override on behalf of a patient. The bill sets forth five criteria as the basis for the request and requires adequate supporting rationale and documentation from the physician. AB 374 does not prohibit step therapy protocols. Rather, the bill establishes an override determination request to ensure patient, patients' unique needs are taken into consideration. With that, I thank you and ask for your I vote. Mr. Jones, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise in support of AB 374. As a cancer survivor, I was very thankful for having a very good health plan uh, when that situation happened in my life. But at the same time, I wanted my doctor to be in charge of my treatment. And so uh, with that, I believe that this bill moves in the direction that we need to move with physicians and patients deciding their health care. And for that, I ask for an I vote. With that, the clerk will open the roll. All members vote or desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote or desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll. Tally the vote. Ayes 56. Noes 9. Measure passes. Moving up in the file, members to file item 172. That's AB 1293. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1293 by Assembly Member Holden and Act Relating to Civil Service. Mr. Holden, you may open. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Existing law requires civil service employees, bargaining units, to be notified when state contracts are put out to bid. In August of 2014, the California Correctional Health Care Services Agency created an emergency need for contract registry staff by laying off its civil service workforce and replacing them with temporary contractors with the claim that there was a shortage of work. This was an unsubstantiated claim because the State Controller's Office reported that registered civil service nurses worked a total of 400,000 hours of overtime between June and December of 2014 and 288 open civil service health care positions. Clearly, with 288 open positions and hundreds of thousands of hours in overtime, there was need for permanent civil service employees. AB 1293 prohibits state departments from creating a need for emergency staffing when sufficient work exists to maintain civil service employee positions. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Mr. Harper, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. AB 1293 would increase job security for state employees by expanding protections against contracting out for any reason. State agencies should be focused on serving the public and getting the job done, not protecting civil service jobs. We should encourage contracting out for highly specialized or skilled jobs, especially in emergency situations. Contractors can do the work at a cheaper rate and be more efficient, minus the costs associated with hiring additional full-time employees. State agencies can and should save taxpayers money by contracting out when necessary. This legislature should not make it harder for the state government to save. I urge a no vote. Mr. Jones, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I also rise in opposition to AB 1293 with uh, extreme res uh, respect and deference to the author. 
but as a prior city council member, um, our city was able to avoid uh, several financial difficulties by contracting out several city services, and this has uh, been proven across the state, and so for those reasons, I'll also be voting no. Thank you. All debate having ceased, Mr. Holden, you may close, if you wish. With that, the clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll. Tally the vote. Eyes 48, nose 22. Measure passes. File item 173. That's AB 1301. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1301 by Assemblymember Joan Sawyer and others in Act Lane to Elections. Mr. Joan Sawyer, you may open. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When Congress enacted the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965, it determined that racial discrimination in voting had been more prevalent in certain areas of the country. Section 4 of the VRA established a formula to, uh, to identify those geographic areas to be subject to preclearance under Section 5. For nearly 50 years, Section 5 of VRA served as our democracy's checkpoint in protecting millions of voters of color from, racial, from racially discriminatory voting practices. In June 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court ended this protection when it shamefully held the coverage formula of the VRA to be unconstitutional. In an effort to remedy the abrupt ending of Section 5 coverage and to ensure that the right to vote is not abridged or denied in California, AB 1301 requires certain political subdivisions to obtain approval from the Secretary of State before implementing specified policy changes related to elections. In consideration of parties' administrative concerns, I have amended the bill to preserve counties' flexibility to timely adjust polling precinct locations as necessary. As such, this bill has no opposition. I respectfully ask for your aye vote. Mr. Alejo, do you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also rise in strong support of this bill. I authored this bill last year, but I also rise as the member who represents one of three counties only in California that were covered under Sections 4 and 5 of the preclearance requirement, uh, Yuba, Kings, and Monterey County. And as a young legal aid lawyer, I took on some voting rights cases that, um, that challenged changes and the closing of, of polling places that would have disenfranchised minority voters, in particular farm workers in some of the poorest parts of Monterey County. Luckily, that preclearance requirement was an effective tool to appeal and make a complaint with the Department of Justice, and we got that problem rectified before the election came around. This preclearance is really important because it allows protections uh, to prevent and uh, uh, prevent problems or violate civil rights and voting rights violations before they occur, not a remedy after the election's already over. So this part is critical, but it also shows that here in California we support civil rights, the most important uh, provisions of the Federal Voting Rights Act in light of the horrible decision in Shelby County. I respectfully ask for an I vote. Mr. Gallagher, you are recognized. Mr. Speaker, members, I rise in opposition to this bill. This is an overbroad and costly mandate on our local uh, governments in California. Section 4 of the federal VRA, as was discussed, specifically required that you would have to show that the jurisdiction had a history of targeting minority populations. This bill doesn't do that. It doesn't keep the Section 4 of the federal VRA. Instead, it says that any community, any local jurisdiction that has a minority population of 20 percent or more is already subject to preclearance. So we're sort of saying that jurisdictions are guilty before they're, before they're proven innocent. And um, we're putting the burden on them to, to prove a negative, that they don't have discriminatory practices. That's why this is an overbroad overreach, and it's going to be a costly mandate on counties. I know because the, the assembly district I represent includes Yuba County, which was included in preclearance and federal preclearance. And the reason for that was because we had an Air Force base. And there was disparities between population and, and registrations in that counties. It took them years to finally get off preclearance at great cost. Anytime there was a change to districts or elections in that county, it was a huge burden on the local government. And they had no problem with discriminatory practices. And yet they fell under this. Now we're going to make all counties, cities be potentially subject to very burdensome regulations uh, this isn't the right way to address the situation, members. I urge your no vote. 
Mr. Harper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition uh, to this uh, bill. This bill to me represents a uh, pattern of uh, further domination of the state of California over local jurisdictions in terms of elections. Uh, I'm very concerned about how especially these kinds of subjective decisions can be made over local decisions whether or not to have districts and how to have districts or whether or not to have at-large elections. I'm very concerned with this, uh, with this broad overreach the state of California has in terms of this pattern of domination and I urge a no vote. Mr. Wagner, you are recognized. Thank you. I rise to join my colleagues in urging a no vote on, on a bill that is uh, very much an overreaction to a Supreme Court decision and uh, does in fact impose some very stringent requirements on uh, local jurisdictions absolutely without any showing of any problems or of any guilt or of any history of, of questionable activities. As was explained by, by my colleague uh, Mr. Gallagher, you are under this bill guilty unless you prove the negative, and um, we're, asked to, we're asked to do this, and the question is why? Well, the, the answer is to, uh, according to the author, to get, uh, get back at the Supreme Court and its shameful decision in Shelby. Well, the shameful decision in Shelby was actually a very reasonable and very narrow decision that said um, Section 4, uh, created in the 60s, needs to be updated if you're going to still apply it. We are very much beyond where we were in the 60s, thankfully, very rightfully, and in part because of the Voting Rights Act. The Shelby Court didn't get rid of the Voting Rights Act. The Shelby Court didn't undermine the Voting Rights Act. The Shelby Court only said, Congress, if you like Section 4, go back and update it. The problem my colleagues on the floor have here is Congress hasn't done that. So they want to try to do an end run around. Well, the court said it's up to Congress. The court said the Voting Rights Act remains in place. If any of these jurisdictions that are now affected by this bill, any of these guilty before being proven innocent jurisdictions are affected by the bill, well, heck, the Voting Rights Act still applies. You still have a remedy. You still have in force all of the protections as before. All we're doing here is adding a costly additional wholly unnecessary mandate um, that, that really takes away uh, local control and the abilities of our locals to run elections. And that is the wrong way to go to do something that Congress could very simply do, taking the Supreme Court at its word and updating Section 4. I urge a no vote. Mr. Ridley Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of AB 1301 and thank the gentleman from South Los Angeles for bringing this common sense measure forward. Regulation for the protection of civil rights is appropriate, and if local jurisdictions were so smart and able to make sure that they had inclusionary voting practices, we wouldn't have the research that is associated with something called racially polarized voting that has produced every a diennial census period before reapportionment and redistricting at the special district, at the local, at the state, and at the congressional level. And it is the responsibility of this state, if the federal government abdicates its protection of civil rights and voting rights, to step forward. This is a responsible proposal. We have a Secretary of State who is tasked with managing the election system and ensuring that we have equal protection under the law with respect to elections. I would respectfully request an I vote on this common sense, good government, civil rights protection for the 21st century. Thank you to the author for bringing it forward. Thank you, Mr. Ridley Thomas. With that, Mr. Jones Sawyer, you may close. And I, I want to thank everyone for their comments. Um, this bill just merely ensures that we provide protections that we all want to have as a voter in, in California. Because of the actions that happened in the Supreme Court, those protections are at jeopardy. And at the end of the day, with, with the help of the Secretary of State, we will have pre-clearance and an opportunity to know ahead of time whether or not citizens can vote in every county in California. So I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Sawyer, clerk will open the roll. All members vote or desire to vote. All members vote or desire to vote. All members vote or desire to vote. The clerk will close the roll and tally the vote. Ayes 47, noes 21, measure passes. 
File item 174, pass and retain. File item 175, that's AB 1461, clerk will read. Assembly Bill 1461 by Assembly Member Gonzalez and others, an act relating to elections. Ms. Gonzalez, you may open. Good afternoon, Speaker and members. Over the last several years, California's voter statistics have waned in every aspect. And despite the passage of the National Voter Registration Act over 20 years ago, California remains out of compliance for accomplishing easy DMV registration. This is why Secretary of State Alex Padilla has sponsored Assembly Bill 1461, the California New Motor Voter Act. Simply put, the California New Motor Voter Act aims to make voter registration easier when citizens interact with the DMV, thereby increasing opportunities for eligible citizens to participate in our democracy. More specifically, this bill will require the DMV to automatically transfer voter registration information to the Secretary of State when a citizen obtains or renews a driver's license or state ID. It will require the Secretary of State to provide notice to the citizens stating that they will be registered to vote unless they decline to be registered within 21 days. It will require the Secretary of State to provide the records to the county election official of the county in which the person may be registered to vote if eligible to vote. With this bill, it is our hope that California will automatically register the nearly 6.5 million unregistered voters and citizens, and then we can simply focus on finally getting them out to vote. I respectfully ask for an aye vote. Mr. Gomez. Mr. Gomez is deferring to Ms. Baker. Ms. Baker. Forger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I rise in opposition to this bill from our colleague from San Diego. Uh, for several reasons. First and foremost is it takes away the choice of citizens in this country to decide whether or not to register to vote. That is a choice. It is one that should be exercised with free will, knowingly, and on purpose. Secondly, it is unnecessary that we enact this bill. We have uh, same-day registration coming down in the law. This has already been passed. We are going to have same-day registration. If you really think that the lack of registration is why people don't show up to vote, uh, Same-day registration may be about to take care of that. But the reality is it's unnecessary because registration is not the reason why people don't vote. If we want people to vote, we need to do our jobs and inspire them to vote and to show up and create a culture in this country that democracy is what should be exercised and not make sure that we just register everybody to vote automatically. And finally, this is costly. This bill will cost the DMV significant costs to retrofit their systems, as well as to include more security in their systems to protect our personal data. Earlier today, on this floor, we passed a good bill from our colleague from San Rafael, which does make it easier for those who go to the DMV to have their registration happen and transfer that information to the Secretary of State with choice intentional choice to exercise their right. That's the bill we should all stand behind, and I strongly urge a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Gomez, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, I rise in support of AB 1461. This is an idea that I actually uh, thought about and kicked around with my staff for over the last several years regarding um, an opt-out provision instead of an opt-in at the DMV. Um, it's a discussion that I actually had with the, with the gentleman from San Rafael, uh, San Rafael uh, about his bill. And that's why we had let out two bills out of appropriations, because we felt that it was a discussion important to have on this floor and also through the legislative process. Um, one thing we have to remember, the voter registration was never meant to encourage people to vote. It was always meant to... Uh, keep people from voting, right? When we first started this country, only land-owning white males had the right to vote. Then we expanded it to uh, all males, and then women. And then we started trying to emphasize more individuals to vote. So if you really think about it, if you really go down to the essence of being a citizen, that you are born with this right as a U.S. citizen to make your voice heard in the legislative process. No matter... If, uh, if, you were, um, if you're born here and you're naturalized here, you have an inherent right. But now with this inherent right, we make people jump through loop after hoop after hoop just to exercise that right. You know, in, in, uh, I took a trip to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is the commonwealth of, of this country. They actually participate in, their, um, in our presidential elections. I got to be there. They have 80% voter turnout, but without a voter file, 
But yet, when they come to this country, is it something in the water or is it something in the air? The voter participation drops dramatically, right? So we have to kind of think about why are these barriers actually Im influencing turnout? So I, I believe this bill is a great discussion to have. If you are a U.S. citizen, shouldn't you have that right without jumping from hoop to hoop to make sure you, have, uh, you can exercise that right? So I ask you to vote aye on this bill to keep the conversation moving forward, and let's see how we can make our democracy a little bit stronger, a little bit more inclusive, and a little bit more unifying. Thank you so much. Mr. Alejo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I also rise as a joint author of this bill along with my colleagues from San Diego and Sacramento. North and Southern California are represented and certainly sponsored by our new Secretary of State, Alex Padilla. But as a chair of the Latino Caucus, I also rise because this is also one of our priority bills because you know how important it is to address this issue. Just under 30% of our eligible citizens cast a ballot last November, which brings California in at 43rd among the 50 states in voter participation. AB 1461 aims to address California's lack of voter turnout by making voter registration easier for eligible citizens to interact with the DMV, thereby increasing opportunities for those eligible citizens to participate in our democracy. We all know that the foundation of a strong democracy is an active citizenry. With this bill, it is our hope that California will expand the size of its electorate in an attempt to increase the number of citizens who participate. But this bill will also save money by reducing the paper process, removing an antiquated and redundant step in the voter registration. And this is a simple bill that embraces our right to vote by embracing technology and ensuring everyone has an equal opportunity to remain automatically registered to vote. Our neighbor to the north, the state of Oregon, is already implementing this exact bill this year. California will be next in making this important policy a reality. And this is certainly a historic bill that will go down as one of the most transformative bills in addressing voter registration. Each of us in this room, each of us who are elected to serve our constituents, talk, do a lot of talking uh, and a lot of encouraging every election cycle, encouraging people here to vote. But this is something you don't have to be talking about anymore because you have the opportunity to take action right before your eyes in this very room to make everyone automatically registered to vote. Those who do not support this bill, I know that in a few years they'll look back and regret the decision to not support this day, uh, to not support this bill on this day on this floor. Mr. Williams, you are recognized. Mr. Speaker, members, as chair of the API caucus, I rise in support of 1461. Voter registration is one of the single greatest barriers to democratic and civic participation in our nation. And I don't ba just base this off of ideology. I saw this at, at work. I, I worked in an election in another country, in South Africa, the first democratic elections in 1994. And it was eye-opening to me that you could have a system that adequately uh, prevented fraud, but also uh, was not a hassle to vote, right? Voter registration, we are one of the only Western industrialized nations to make it so difficult um, to vote. And having three or four steps in voting as opposed to one or two. Uh, so uh, this bill aims to address that extremely low voter turnout. And members, it could only help not hurt civic participation. Uh, I ask for your eye vote. Mr. Harper, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to strongly disagree with my colleagues from Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. Voter registration is intended to be disclosure. Each of us knows who to campaign to when we know who is registered to vote. That is the purpose of voter registration. Otherwise, you have no idea who is going to be able to show up in the polls when it comes to election day or in the case of how we operate now, election month with vote by mail elections. And so it is absolutely critical to make sure that we have voter registration. It is not indeed a barrier. It's a matter of disclosure. Additionally, I want to uh, uh, rise to a concern that I think many people will have and I think should be addressed in this bill is I think many citizens will be concerned if indeed there's automatic voter registration, will they be automatically listed for jury duty? Mr. McCarty, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a joint author, I also rise in support of this measure. 
And when you think about voter participation in California, you really think about two problems. First is not enough people are registered to vote. We know we're 38 of 50 states in the union as far as registration. We know that too few people actually participate in the voting process. Well, this bill really crosses the first problem off the list, and it does about an innovative and smart way. And when you think about it, all the money currently be spent that we spend now on the state and local level on voter registration, mailing out the forms, both in the, in the private sector as well, doing voter registration efforts, all those resources can be, can be better allocated now on voter education and engagement. I think this is a smart and innovative approach, as we heard earlier, about an idea that's being formulated in the, in the north in Oregon and at times right here in California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarty. Mr. Jones, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, you know, our, our colleague from Los Angeles made some very compelling arguments about voting being an inherent right. And I agree with him on that statement, that it is an inherent right in America and in a lot of countries around the world today. But sometimes rights have to be protected. And in protecting those rights, we have to make sure that the people who are supposed to be voting are the ones voting. And with that, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I have a, a question for the author on a detail of the bill. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, currently, um, paroled felons, most paroled felons, if not all paroled felons, are prohibited from being able to vote. Uh, I think we can all argue that it's not the DMV's job to uh, determine when, when people come to get a driver's license who's a paroled felon and who's not a paroled felon, because paroled felons do have the right to drive in a lot of cases. Um, so how would your bill propose for the DMV to separate between those paroled felons that are allowed to vote and those that are not allowed to vote? In answering um, my colleague from East San Diego County, that is not the DMV's job. It's not now. It's the Secretary of State's job, and he will continue to do what he does today, and that is check the list every six months and inform counties when there are people who are currently ineligible to vote so that they'll be taken off. That's what happens today. It'll continue to happen, and that, that's not a, a real issue. Thank you. Back on my own time. Well, I, I, I do strongly disagree that that's not a real issue because uh, it absolutely is a real issue. And I think that the issue that is real is rife with problems that uh, may or may not be able to be solved. And I don't have the confidence level that they can be solved uh, between those two departments. So with that and the additional challenges that have been raised earlier uh, in opposition, I also stand opposed to this bill and ask for a no vote. All debate having ceased, Ms. Gonzalez, you may close. In closing, I, I do want to address some of the issues brought up. Of course, um, the first being the one that was just brought up, that yes, in fact, today we have the same issue because people actually were on voting rolls before they went to prison, and they need to be informed, the counties do, when somebody is ineligible. It happens today every six months. It'll continue to happen after this bill is passed. As far as the idea that registration is somehow a disclosure to know who we campaign to, I find that statement almost offensive. I think it would be a positive thing if we are actually talking to more people that we represent. I actually think that might have them turn out. Furthermore, we all know, because we've been involved in campaigns, that you actually get a list that says how often somebody votes. So if you want to target your campaign to just those people that you're absolutely sure will turn out, you already do that. Let's be honest. It's not a real issue. As far as choice, you do have the choice to not register because you have the opportunity to opt out. Soon as the Secretary of State has that information, he will then send a card to everybody that is registered and give them an opportunity, A, not only to opt out, but B, to choose a political party if they so choose. As far as same-day registration, that's nice, but do not tell me the reason people do not vote is because they're not registered. Three to four million people Googled after the registration date last election, how do I register to vote? Three to four million people in the United States were looking at a way to register to vote after the deadline. Quite frankly, what this will allow people to do is apply for an absentee ballot in case they are not eligible, are able to make it to a precinct on that day to vote. If you've ever represented working people who work two or three jobs, sometimes the second to, or the first Tuesday in November it is not the most opportune time to be able to make it to the polls. This will give those folks an opportunity not only to vote already registered, but the opportunity to seek out an absentee ballot and have 30 days to vote. As far as costs, we already heard, I'm glad that, that uh, there are members of this 
floor who think that there was another bill that was good. That other bill has the same cost. We have to update our DMV uh, voter registration process, the computer process, because we're out of compliance with the federal law and we're subject to a lawsuit. That has to happen anyway. There is money in the governor's budget to do just that. This will streamline. It will make it easier. And yes, there is a cost to elections. I'm sorry. That's the cost. That's the cost of freedom, quite frankly. So I, uh, I, I hope I have addressed everybody's issue. This is a good bill. This is the bill that the Secretary of State has sponsored that he wants to see implemented, and I respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. With that, clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. The clerk will close the roll. Tally the vote. Ayes 45, noes 25. Measure passes.